welcome uh, to the uh, Value of Space Conference and this panel discussion. Our panel is uh, addressing the question, how are other sectors using space assets? My name is Scott Cordella and I work for the MITRE Corporation and I'm the moderator of this panel. Um, and uh, I'll introduce our panel members shortly. Today, we wanna to discuss some topics regarding the use of space in other critical infrastructure sectors and how those sectors make use of the services that space provide, such as position navigation, timing, satellite communication, remote sensing, and others. And we're asking those uh, representatives of these ISACs to tell us about how they use the capabilities um, and how they share information about how space is working for their sector, and um, ultimately how that information sharing um, may influence what the uh, newly formed space ISAC uh, could do, should do in support of those uh, sectors. So uh, we'll come back to that, uh, but first let me introduce our panel members. Susan Rogers uh, of the Financial Services ISAC, Scott Blau of the Maritime Transportation System, ISAC, and Catherine Condello of the Communications Sector, ISAC. A quick intro of Susan, Scott, and Catherine. Susan is uh, with the Financial Business Service Resilient Planning Cross Sector Crisis Information Sharing at the Financial Services, ISAC. She has 30 years of experience, including 15 years leading technology, Operation Risk at Bank of America and GMAC. Scott Blau is a seasoned professional in cyber and international security matters. He's a CISO, executive director for the Center of Defense and Forensics at Tiffin University, which is an NSA center of academic excellence. Catherine is from Lumen Technologies and serves as senior director, national security, emergency preparedness. In this position, her roles include resident liaison to DHS National Coordination Center, as well as a strong role in the communications ISAC. So I'm gonna ask our panel members to give a quick overview of themselves, their ISAC, the work that they do, and then we'll go through some questions. So first, to our colleague, Susan, and she'll speak about the uh, financial service ISAC. Susan, over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Scott. So I, I think, you know, having listened to a few of the sessions before this, um, it's been extraordinary to hear from a more a, a technical aspect um, to really think about you know, what, what I'm going to talk about in the financial services is talking about economic critical infrastructure. So not just for uh, the national, the U.S. critical infrastructure, but globally. So um, we'll then, you know, talk a little bit. I'm, Rather than explain my own role there, um, uh, my role really is part of what I'm explaining. It's resilience, it's crisis response coordination, and the partnerships that you see on this call. Um, and we also look forward to building stronger partnerships and uh, both in steady state and crisis state with space ISAC. So next slide, please. So FS ISAC was founded in 1999. It is a not-for-profit. It is part of the uh, Presidential Directive 63 that has uh, connected to the National Infrastructure Plan, the NIP. So you have um, core responsibilities for critical infrastructure on the US side. Now it's a global organization. Um, 2013 and 14, we had massive DDoS attacks on the financial services sector, uh, really expanded our membership. We're currently at 7,000 members, uh, 50 different countries, uh, 70, 70 jurisdictions. And in terms of how we support those countries, uh, we have three uh, major headquarters or major facilities uh, in Singapore, in London, and in Arrest in Virginia. But we have 22 staff members that are outside of the US in nine different countries. So, you know, Australia, Singapore, uh, Canada, excuse me, um, Brazil, and then various European countries. And, you know, COVID-19 is a really good example of why that was so valuable. Very, very early on in January, mid-January, we were hearing directly ground truth coming from our own staff, coming from the members, 
um, from the APAC countries. And then throughout, um, throughout this whole event, we have um, regional focus, you know, the four regions of Americas. Uh, we focused recently on Latin America, EMEA, and APAC. We're all hazards. So, and that will, I'll, I'll give more detail on that as we talk about the services that we have. And uh, we're very focused on member, we're, we're guided by the members, the board of directors is financial services, a sector institutions, and um, I'll tell you more about the members as well. So next slide, please. So th again, thinking earlier in sessions where we were talking about space technology, and some of the folks, a couple individuals, leaders actually mentioned uh, financial assets. So the members of FSISAC are the owners of the critical infrastructure for financial services. Okay, so the majority of assets are owned by these banks, insurance companies, um, investment firms, as well as um, the actual market uh, facilities, market operations. Now, uh, what's interesting too, and this is where the complexity of, where I think it would be really helpful to dig in even deeper later on space asset dependency, is the complexity that financial services has with third parties, right? The global complexity. Um, I'll give you an example. When I worked um, in a very large bank, um, we had a mobile product for banking. It was one of the earliest mobile products. There were over a hundred applications that made up just that one application, and the architecture was so disparate in multiple facilities, locations. So the interdependency of, that's just one example of so many of the critical functions and applications that financial services use. So that complexity is really a major vulnerability and something that we continually work towards to mitigate. Uh, next slide, please. So if I'm a member of FS ISAC, um, what's interesting with ISACs, uh, they're all different shapes and sizes, right? The, no, some are, are focused on cybersecurity, on trusted information sharing, um, steady state coordination. Um, others focus on cyber, but also manage it's my, my, my dogs, <laughs> okay? But also um, the idea of crisis coordination, right? And then others are a blend of cyber and physical risk mitigation analysis. So with FSISAC, um, it started out in that tsunami of membership, right, based on the DDoS. Majority of our early members were CISO, right, focused on information security, your network defenders. But what happened over time, uh, we have a structure called a community of interest. We have over 40 of those and they are peer organizations. So we have a community of interest for asset managers, for media response uh, leaders, and those leaders coordinate messaging around a specific event. I mean, I can go on, there's so many different types, uh, mortgage assets, insurance assets. So the goal here is get them connected. So you see here, um, I'm not, I won't go through all the different types of tools, but the idea of how do we connect these peers, uh, we, they have daily interaction, we have alerts that they are getting, they're sharing uh, with each other. And um, what's interesting when there's an event, how do you build trust, okay? Um, some people will say, well, if there's an event, no one's gonna talk about impact, right? They're gonna bring, the lawyers are gonna come in, they won't talk. But what we find is that because of these longer term trusted relationships, plus the fact that members have skin in the game, right? The threat is to themselves. So when what happens when you have impacted institutions, they will get together in very small groups and they will, you know, that kind of cancels out the reputation risk because of that collaboration. So you truly have the value of trust and the idea of that peer coordination, that dynamic um, as what, not just well, longstanding relationships and routines, but also um, the smaller, more focused and anonymous trusting and sharing that takes place that we facilitate. So next, next slide. So I'm gonna go through, there's three, org three groupings of products that uh, FSISAC coordinates. So next slide, please. The first one is intelligence. And this is uh, all of the various threat reporting, the threat calls, the briefings, 
that we do throughout our global um, regions. And what's important here is whenever um, an alert is sent out, it's going to all our members, no matter what country. So that idea of instantaneous, we're all aware together, is something that's an extremely valuable um, tool. And we sell, you know, it's, it's funny, that's, that's really what gets folks connected and consistently participating. On the other side of it is you have to help folks manage their inbox, right? They have, we, we work very closely with members to um, you know, really focus on what they need to not be overwhelmed by uh, the volume of alerts and reports. Uh, a lot of C-level intelligence, so we do executive reporting on behalf of the sector or the focus of the sector. Here's what you, the CRO, the CIO, C CTO, et cetera, should be focused on right now, this month. And everything we do is through the lens and interpretation of potential disruption to the financial sector. We have um, more in, in the next section, but the, I, the idea of crisis coordination calls, of spotlight calls, um, very you know, the speed with which we can bring experts in front of our members to address a situation is, is what we strive for. Uh, next slide, please. And one more quick thing, though, the intel there, again, you've got all of the baseline intelligence, right? So the, um, you know, the, all of the cyber daily routine alerts, impacts, all of that is going through our intelligence. Next slide, please. So resilience is, is actually a lot of how I've met Catherine Condello, is through our resilience work, okay? So part of it is developing um, partnerships. So part of that National Council of ISACs, the relationships we have with other sectors, uh, the exercises that we work on together. So that from a cross-sector standpoint, how do we practice and anticipate how we will address the problem? On the other side of, of the sector itself, uh, we have developed and financed uh, complex playbooks. Um, the events that I'm going to talk about are actually the critical risks that um, really are dependent on space assets. We practice them, we plan them. Uh, the financial industry is funded by these massive banks and they absolutely understand the importance of, of looking at risk, planning it, getting the right experts at the table. So the development of the plan, playbooks, bringing the expert, having those ready to call together and to respond, and then those coordination mechanisms are all part of some of the work that we do. FSISIC does become this centralized coordination place. We're not the only group that does that. We partner with the US Treasury. Uh, there's also a market organization called SIFMA that does the coordination across uh, disruptions of the market. And then our, our coordinating council, FISIC, right? And when there's an event, we have a playbook where they immediately, those core groups come together, interpret, What's the potential for disruption? Who are the experts we need? And we quickly form, um, we expand getting the right experts on the call. And then over time, there are crisis management teams that are formed and manage an event. That's both cyber as well as the physical disruption events. And um, crisis response coordination is, it takes multiple forms. We have the ability in FSI SAC to manage coordination for a physical event, hurricanes, fires. Um, we get very involved in trying to help support critical infrastructure. So we're one of the examples is producing, uh, working with our credit card companies to produce ATM and uh, merchant availability reporting. So I'm able to get that report, give it to Catherine's folks. And if uh, when telecom as well as like electricity trucks are reconnecting assets, they, they know where to get gas, where ATMs are functioning. So something as, as simple as that, of being able to use financial assets to help in crisis coordination, that's been, we continue to look for opportunities for that. All right, the next slide, please. So trust is built through routine, right? That's, we, we know that over and over. Um, we once had, we had an exercise with, um, the exercises, by the way, that I didn't mention earlier, but really complex. We've had exercises and they're usually focused around the US Treasury will bring us together. We focus on the major events, liquidity crisis, um, disruption to cloud provider. I mean, we can go on and on and many of them touch upon um, critical functions. But what's interesting is um, 
how do we now learn from that? How do we start to have live events for training, webinars? We take the exercise learnings and create uh, the after action reports. It's not just FSI SAC. This is very much members coming in, identifying the priorities within the sector. What priorities do they want to work on together? And um, an example of that is actually one of the activities was a tri-sector playbook where um, we, we really truly wanted to get together with communications and electricity and understand when there's a, dis a really, really bad day, um, how can these critical groups like a big institution on a bank, um, how could they prioritize recovery of a critical service? So the idea of, again, who do you go to? How quickly can you connect? Is something you'll hear that over and over with our critical groups. Next slide. All right, we're probably all going to touch upon this idea of the national critical functions. So this was an effort about a year and a half ago. Uh, DHS brought the sectors together uh, with their sector coordinating uh, group or with their, excuse me, their government leader organizations, sector specific agencies. Excuse me, use the right terminology. And th there's a complete list. Um, these six are specific to finance, but so many of these national functions are interdependent on what finance, you know, finance depends on other critical infrastructure. So, but I, I wanted to just read these through because as we talk about, you know, the what's important in space assets, some of these are just very common sense and, and obvious. But capital markets and investment activities. So the interdependent, have the speed with which capital, which markets trade, the automation, right? All of that, the interdependency on timing, right? So GPS and, and satellite, all of this is your most critical assets. Every single one of them will be disrupted. And the consumer and commercial banking services, again, the complexity of um, consumer and commercial is, is actually providing banking, providing the finances, um, causing calm in the public. Um, when there's a, if there were a specific outage, a really bad day, our goal is to calm the public, right? How do we get them the assets that they need? You know, we actually have a little bit of, um, you could tell a little bit of how that would act at Puerto Rico and Hurricane Maria is a really good example where we were able to get cash to Puerto Rico when very little else was getting to Puerto Rico. Uh, and we were able to really coordinate to make sure people had the electricity, the, the um, generators, and there was a coordination to limit cash, but at least folks had cash. So that's that focus on the calm of public um, is very, we work a lot with our Fed Reserve as well as Treasury to support that. Insurance services, I was thinking insurance in conjunction with wholesale funding, um, but the complexity of insurance is, is so much of the investment side, right? The investments in treasuries and, and really big capital markets. So the complexity is all the tools that they depend upon that are also dependent on space, space assets. Uh, payment clearing settlement services. Um, so here's, a, here's some of the big names, SWIFT, right? So how wires are transferred, how, how securities are, are, excuse me, are could possibly be disrupted. Uh, we've act, and again, a lot of these we've exercised, right? We some of them we have pretty interesting plans that will, you know, at the very least, should an event occur, we take an action. We know how to connect and who to contact. So um, that's the good side of this. Next slide. All right, I wanted to just show this this last slide. And whenever, when I first came to FSI SAC, uh, one of the first things that I learned was the concept of public-private sharing, and it's a continual development of relationships. So I have a slide, this could be, this is really the US version, but I also have a global version where we're constantly, as we build more and more members, more and more relationships, um, we continue to develop relationships with trusted, or with trade groups, right? Um, example with COVID, right? We get together, we have activated our playbook for COVID ever since the end of January. And not just uh, the financial institutions and, but, but also the trade organizations, right? Because 
we reach out, we communicate with the trade, we coordinate on activities on messaging, but that trade group has that has a broad outreach. And the thing to really keep in mind is, in a sense, if there were an event, how do you find out? Well, if we have 7,000 members and we have trade associations that have other thousands of members, we find out like this, okay? All of our members, we have um, email listservs, private sector, or, excuse me, secure chat. And when there's an event, I immediately go to my listservs, understand what's the dialogue, what are the concerns? Now, one of the big issues around critical third party, right? How do you find out if there's a disruption to a third party provider? Um, there's a lot of conflict around that because you don't always hear directly, directly from the third party. Well, we know because we, see, we hear from the impacted institutions. So this idea of really having a sense of, the, of what's going on based on the communities, the relationships and the connectivity, that's what this is, is a foundation for. Um, we also try, you know, on a public side, we have um, the regulators, the state connections, the um, regional partnerships that we develop, and then um, the cross-sector work down the bottom left, and then the law enforcement. Now, from a global side, we've got, in all those three countries that I mentioned, the, excuse me, that we're uh, with our headquarters, uh, we are directly connected into their critical, um, the, the finance side. Uh, now, we aren't necessarily critical infrastructure in those countries. That's, the, that's a very important thing about what U.S. has done. By including finance and critical infrastructure, the speed with which we can communicate and understand what's going on is it's really um, a value. We constantly try to go to those countries and talk about, you know, let us in. If you include us and we, we can figure out a way to uh, share with you in a trusted format, we're actually having that discussion with the NATO uh, lock shield exercise is, you know, how do we actually share? Our members share, but are there additional uh, relationships, contracts, partnerships that we need to build that a, when a systemic event that would roll across countries would occur, how do we know? How do we, how do we uh, reach out, ask for a request for information for another country, for another partner? And, you know, that is, again, um, what I'm going to ask later when Scott talks to us about what Scott, what Space ISAC can do to us is very much in, in, in this vein of when we need you, how do we, how do we communicate? And that's it. I will great. hand over back to Scott. That's great. Susan, thank you very much. Scott, would you tell us a little bit about the Maritime Transportation System, ISAC, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Thanks, Susan. That was, that was great. It was a Great uh, overview, not only of financial sector, but pretty much what ISACs do. So thank you very much. So I'm Scott Blau. Um, I'm a, a strategic uh, partner or a trusted partner with MTS ISAC and also the CISO and executive director for the Center of, for Cyber Defense and Forensics at Tiffin University. So um, if you could go to the next slide. So the MTS ISAC, uh, we're relatively new. We were formed in February of this year. Um, the only international maritime information sharing organization um, formed by critical infrastructure stakeholders. Uh, the basic goal there is to promote cybersecurity information sharing throughout the MTS community. And as you'll see in a couple slides later, um, the international aspect is quite important. Um, why did they form uh, actionable, relevant, and contextualized cybersecurity intelligence uh, collected from the uh, MTS private and public sector partner shares? and analyzed at the MTS ISAC and then spread out among the uh, partners that they need to uh, contact. And who can get involved or who is involved? Uh, we have maritime critical infrastructure stakeholders, um, vessel owners, operators, ports, port tenants, terminal operators, vendor suppliers, intermodal and class societies, public sector, and universities now. So um, kind of a, a broad swath of organization. Next slide, please. Uh, this is another slide that gives um, a little bit more information. Um, the key, again, is sharing that regional, national, and international um, information in sort of a, um, I guess, for lack of a better term, community way. Um, so we, we realize that as we branch out a port, uh, for instance, as a community of suppliers or the supply chain for the port. Um, so uh, you have intermodal truck drivers, you have uh, intermodal logistic things, trains, um, you have delivery of, of goods and all those sorts of things. So um, that's one of the things that we really looked at was to sort of branch out into that community as well to see um, sort of the cascading impacts. 
Um, they are a member of the uh, National Council of ISACs, um, sharing information with 23 other ISACs. Um, and we are the trusted partner for anonymized maritime reporting. And that's one of the key things that allows members to report to us is uh, there's no information that's attributable to um, any one uh, customer. Next slide. So this is just real quick um, information. So in the United States, we have uh, 3,500 marine terminals, over 25,000 miles of navigable channels, and 250 locks. And I'm not talking about the locks that you know you put on your door. These are the ones that race in lower ships. So um, just wanted to point that out. Next slide. Um, so another reason we talk about the uh, international impact. So 99% um, of overseas trade is involved in the maritime transportation system. Uh, it's worth about 500 billion to the U US GDP, um, supports over 200 billion in taxes, 10 million jobs, and overall it's 90% of the world's trade. So 90% of goods that you touch and, and buy come from the maritime transportation system. Next slide, please. So um, I looked at uh, the document that Susan referenced earlier um, that was, I think, created a little bit earlier this year. And so um, they, they kind of had distribute, manage, supply, and connect. And you can see the sort of connected circle there. So I pulled just a couple of those out uh, just to kind of make a couple points here. So um, under distribute, obviously, you saw that 90% um, of the world's goods travel through uh, the maritime transportation system. So we've got transport, cargo, passengers, and then, and then the supply chain. Um, under manage, the, this is a key issue, manage and or provide and maintain infrastructure. Without the maritime transportation sector, um, a lot of roads would not get built, um, train tracks would not get built, and you know, specifically a lot of offshore um, fuel would not be uh, transported into the, into the ports. Um, supply, uh, they provide food, materials, um, and also support to the defense. That, that's a key, uh, another key area. And then how does it connect to the, uh, to the space ISAC? Um, obviously, the, the PNT, Position Navigation Timing, um, and the Communication Network uh, Access, that's very important in the maritime transportation system. Um, we do have radio-based AIS uh, along the coastlines, but anytime you're outside of that, you're relying on GPS signals. And in fact, most of the uh, shoreline AIS is now done via GPS signal as well. So um, I do some research into GPS spoofing. And uh, that, that's a, also a huge issue when you get um, over around uh, Iran, China, in that, in that general vicinity. So um, that's another, another big issue. So next slide. This is just a quick threat vector uh, thing that you can look at. Um, the threat vectors on a ship are they have communication system, bridge, power, access control, passenger systems, um, administrative systems, supply chain systems. And a lot of times folks don't even know about these systems. Um, I could tell you horror stories of um, ships docking and having people to come fix their engine when they didn't know it was broken, but the, the engine called back to home and said it was broken, so they came to fix it. Um, so those are significant um, cyber issues. And that's I, I just put this on here more of a, as a reference point for everyone that's attending so that they can see that. Next slide. Um, so I, I made this little chart or little circle Venn diagram. Um, and I, I sort of put space assets at the bottom, and then I sort of expanded out upon that. Um, so the first level, I think, is probably navigation is the most important. Um, detection and enforcement. There are a lot of law enforcement agencies that use space assets in the maritime sector, um, and that detection and enforcement is crucial to the operation of the maritime transportation sector. And then finally, communication, as you know, is uh, generally across the various ISECs. So. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions as, as we move forward. I think that's my last slide. Am I correct? I think the other two are just informational. Yeah. So there's where you can go see the Maritime Transportation System ISAC, and the next slide um, has some of my information on it. So don't need to go over that. That's great, Scott. Thank you very much. Catherine, would you tell us about your world and uh, what uh, your sector does? <clears throat> Uh, thank you again for inviting me. I, I feel like I'm visiting my second cousin, you know. <laughs> um, I would like to talk about sort of the communication sector broadly because um, I, I think of all the sectors, uh, it is one of the sectors that has had the deepest relationship with government. And because of that, you know, I think it's not so much complex, but we've kind of 
um, segmented how we engage with government, and I'm definitely going to focus on the communications ISAC because you're the space ISAC. Um, I am the vice chair of the communications sector coordinating council, which is the designated body through which government sort of interacts with the sector. Uh, so I can speak both is my role as a sector as well as my role at the ISAC. Go ahead. So what I'd hope to uh, communicate today is how the sector is organized, including our ISAC, who is engaged, who's involved, and, and what are our key functions. Um, the communication sector is comprised of five separate segments. Satellite is one of them. Welcome to the family. Um, we have the broadcasters, the cable guys, you know, like Comcast, Charter, Cox, uh, the wireless guys, the wireline guys, which Lumen, formerly CenturyLink, is certainly involved in that category, and then, of course, the satellite folks. Um, we don't have an accurate number of how many people that are domestically um, based are in our sector, but it is somewhere, when you just put this way, when you've got more than 14,000 radio stations alone, it's a ton. We do not work with 14,000 radio stations, and, and I will sort of speak to sort of who we kind of work with at a sector and an ISAC level. Go ahead. Next slide. So the Sector Coordinating Council, the reason I'm speaking to it is because it is the body that acts as the entry point for government writ large to deal with risk assessments, risk issues, concerns about communications. And it's through the Sector Coordinating Council that we then kind of triage topics and we either move them into what we call the strategic level, which is where our CEOs work with the government at the uh, Interpresidential Advisory Committee called NSTAC. Uh, the sector kind of does the planning activities and the risk assessments. And then issues that are more operational, we drive down to our communications ISAC. I would note that the communications ISAC is the only joint government public-private joint uh, ISAC. Um, it's been this way over for over 35 years. Uh, DHS acts as our 24-7 watch desk, um, but that's just the way we've done it. We like it that way. Nobody else has to do it that way, but I just want to let you know that's how we do it. Next. Let me go just a little bit deeper because I want to be able to, because I think as the space ISAC gets more and more mature, you may find that there are mechanisms where you'll want to link with, you know, the, the broader comm sector, and I think it might be useful for you. Um, at the policy level, uh, as I said, our CEOs, and, and I mean 30 CEOs, not 14,000 of them, um, do operate on a presidential advisory committee to talk about the national security issues associated with telecommunications, and that is for all five segments, including satellite. I would comment that at the NSTAC, um, there are already four companies that are that support and sort of quasi-represent uh, satellite interests, um, L3 Harris, Iridium, Raytheon, and Lockheed Martin Space Systems. Um, at the communications sector, at the coordinating council, um, this is where we do a lot of the risk assessment work, and this is where we do a lot of planning associated with multiple executive orders, you know, what are the problems with 5G, supply chain, that sort of thing. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk about who the members are later. It's at the operational level where all of this drives into changes in behavior, changes in our processes, changes in how we work with each other, changes with how we respond to a bad day. My CEO is a member of NSTAC. And Mr. Story tells me, Catherine, we can tell the government whatever we want, you know, being strategic, and you can do whatever plans you want to do. But if it doesn't change how we operate, then we probably did something wrong. So comms is always driving towards process. Go ahead. Um, this is a quick shot of our uh, sector coordinating council ship membership. Uh, because our, comp our sector has so many tiny, 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 tiny companies, uh, we do have a lot of trade associations who re represent some of those interests. I have highlighted for you in yellow who some of the uh, satellite-based companies are that are in the Sector Coordinating Council, and I comment the Satellite Industry Association is on our executive committee. Go ahead. The next picture, though, shows sort of drives down to who are the communications ISAC members. And, um, and if you can read through this mess, <laughs> uh, you will notice that there are a ton of satellite companies. Um, SES, Hughes, Global Star, Boeing, uh, Legato 
of DISH, Raytheon, Inmarsat, and Utelsat. This is the body where we work with government. In particular, we work with DOD, DHS, FEMA, and any other department and agency to respond to issues that will impact you know, our ability to communicate. Um, I strongly suggest that the Space Act gets their you know, self together and kudos for developing this, that to the extent that you want to be able to engage operationally, I would strongly suggest that you, know, you find a way to, and, and we will, I will certainly help broker that discussion with how to sort of build yourself into the emergency support function two capabilities as well. Um, this is a long practice, very, very, very deep, deep, deep relationship. And I think it's one of the reasons why the nation as a whole does get five nines of service and has for the last 30 years. Next. Um, they wanted us to talk a little bit about information sharing. <laughs> um, I think you'll find that you know every sector sort of does it differently. Um, but this, our sector, because there are five segments, and because we've got you know 50 plus years of technologies uh, built in there, uh, just as Susan sort of showed that they've got their law enforcement quadrant and they've got their regulator quadrant, so do we. So if you look at um, you know sort of the bottom right where it says sector policy and planning, this is where we work with the state and the local folks and DHS to just sort of share on the policy level or the planning level information sharing. If you look over to the far right where you'll see sort of brown space, here's where you'll find the Federal Communications Commission, uh, state CIOs, DOD, GSA, other critical infrastructure sectors, sort of public-private partnerships. Um, if you look sort of towards the top, you see, see two brown boxes, which is government, and then a big red one. Um, the two brown boxes are speak to sort of the DHS, NCIC, System Central, as well as state fusion centers. And all of that sort of government stuff ends up coming in through the red box, which is our NCC COM ISAT, and drives to the big blue box, which is in that sort of the network service providers, the owner operators, which are within the sector. Uh, because we do have other sources of information, the dark blue box is actually uh, intelligence that comes in through a number of government contracts that some of us have, uh, where we are sort of informed in advance of things. And so that gets scrubbed and gets sent into the network service providers. And the stuff to the right or stuff to the left, which are sort of predominantly blue boxes, are in essence sort of the relationships that we have you know, with our own network service providers group. I, I joke about it. Frame Relay is a technology that has been used and is probably moving out of, of sort of the, the general telecom space. But there are sh information sharing groups associated with just Frame Relay gurus, okay? And they do their magic. Does it ever touch sort of the ISAC? No, because they don't need the ISAC. What we ultimately end up doing at the ISAC is we act as a portal for external information coming in from government, from other sectors, from other government entities, because the peer-to-peer -peer relationships within the comm sector on things like frame relay versus you know bgp sec things are already very very well indoctrinated and, and and there's nothing there's no additional value i could make go ahead um because we are focusing on the comm isac i did want to sort of you know strut the stuff about what our comm isac has done um these are just some of the engagements that we did in 2019 because we haven't done the one for 2020 but you'll see that we're very very much focused on exercises and this is exercises in addition to the normal disaster as usual that we hang out with susan and the electric guys on um, but so our isac is responsible for doing all the planning for major exercises like the department of energy clear path exercises cyberstorm uh, national level exercises working with dod on norad and northcom uh, exercises we certainly spent a lot of time cross-sector working on de developing, you know, like broadband advisory stuff, working again with Susan on the tri-sector playbook, uh, doing spring training with FEMA, doing spring training with FEMA and all their regional uh, uh, work groups, and working directly on sort of increasing the, um, the viability and, and the, the sort of the, the exchangeability between us and power. Finally, we do focus internationally. We are a global sector. And for me, Lumen, formerly CenturyLink, to not talk to NTT, you know, that would be stupid. So for us to have that kind of collaboration and know how to reach out internationally to some of our major peering partners is, is a focus of the ISAC. Next. Finally, 
I think we're, yeah. So here's the, the big picture about critical functions. Um, and you'll notice there's a, the whole column on the left. Go to the next slide. It's all about connect. Connect is comms. Communications is comms. So satellite, you are part of connect. And there are, I believe, eight critical functions uh, between operating the core, which is like CenturyLink, um, the cable access, which is like Comcast, doing internet-based content, internet routing, um, position navigation and timing, the satellite stuff, the wireless stuff, the wireline stuff. This is the sector as whole. And so this is something that we look forward to working with the Space ISAC on. Uh, we would welcome more uh, engagement with the satellite providers, particularly since the satellite family is going to be exploding so much in the next eight to 10 years. Now, once again, we do this critical functions, and this is all interesting and academically fascinating. But what I think is important is that we're already starting to drill down on, so what would happen if one of these critical functions went wrong? And comms, God bless us, or you know, maybe they just got voluntold. Um, we have, we've actually done the first contingency plan with, with government on what would happen if the core got disrupted. So we look forward to engaging with the Space ISAC, and I'll turn it back to Scott. All right, that's an excellent setup. So in the remaining 20 minutes, we were going to go through some questions. And uh, I think in the interest of time, we've actually covered some of these. So I might even skip the first one because I think all of you have covered your use of position navigation, timing, SATCOM, um, space provided ISR. I, I certainly think, Scott, there's a strong role in the maritime um, surveillance function for uh, imaging from space and so on. So I don't know that I want to spend a lot of time on that one unless anyone wants to say more than what we've already said about it. That is your dependency on these space provided capabilities. So let me just stop and ask uh, anything anybody want to add to what the any of the opening remarks have been uh, I, I'd already. Like, I'd, I'd, like to interject, I'd like to interject one thing. Um, I'm sure the, the space ISAC folks know that there is an exec, a current executive order dealing with um, reliance on PNT. And DHS, who is the communications sector's sector specific agency, is in the process, as well as other SSAs, of going through sector by sector and assessing reliance on PNT. Now, the reliance on PNT in this particular case is not, for instance, um, uh, comms broadly does not rely on PNT. But how do you think about 911 when you don't think about wireless, okay? So in essence, some of the, most of the major services that, that, are, that, that are built on comms are, you know, PNT related, like 911. My point is very simply this. Um, there's gonna be an exercise in the fourth quarter where we're gonna have to go roto-rooter the entire sector again to do a high level assessment of to what extent in the com communication sector, and that includes satellite, do we ourselves rely on position navigation and timing? From that, that work will be bubbled up with all the other sectors, and that will then be sent over to NIST. So we would clearly on the PNT side, we also need to talk to the new uh, wireless, new satellite folks to make sure that your equities are characterized correctly so that when it gets run up into the bubble in terms of your own use of PNT for your own operations, that that's characterized fairly. Back to you, Scott. That helps, thank you. Um, uh, Scott or Susan, anything else regards uh, what we'll call question one before we move on? Okay, um, well, let's talk about uh, how information about vulnerabilities is shared amongst the ISACs. Um, what does that look like? And and I really, uh, I liked Susan's comment about trust is built through routine and perhaps we routinely know who to share with and, and what they are looking for and what we're looking for in return. But, but in general, if you could each, maybe starting with Susan, take a, take a whack at how do you share information on intra ISAC vulnerabilities, things shared between ISACs, what vulnerabilities they share? How do you how do you share that information? Go ahead, Susan. So there's there's a day to day operational approach, right? And then there's a more planning structure approach. Like some of the things that Catherine reviewed in terms of the the DHS work. So um, just simply every day, every day we um, communicate out through the National Council of ISACs. 
there are, um, so ISACs are sharing TLP white, TLP green, TLP amber, so the different traffic light protocols, we respect the sharing protocols. And um, in terms of what FSISAC does is share that information on our, to our membership. So that idea of um, our members are going to understand other sector concerns, risks, vulnerabilities, which are very much a part of those reports that are going out there and we're studying. And in terms of um, a lot of the really truly understanding vulnerabilities is done through um, exercise, is done through actual crisis discussion. Um, you know, the, the, I'm thinking about, um, well, without going into detail, I mean, the financial sector is constantly working on what are our major vulnerabilities. Um, we do this not just at a, a U.S. Sec a level, but a G7 level. There's actually a, a, a cyber priority, uh, a cyber experts list that is being developed around this. But, you, you know, I was looking at some of those concepts and so much of it is, you know, it's related to the DHS work, right? That where all these, where our US sectors came together, they dialogued on um, interdependencies of critical uh, functions, right? Sometimes it's hard to see it, um, but that, that kind of dialogue is consistently taking place. Um, and then you have the exercises. So it's, you know, when you have these big national exercise like Cyberstorm 2020 or FEMA national level exercise, they are done, the planning is a very long uh, process. So that whole concept, you know, how well are you gonna plan? How, who are, where are your players gonna come from? Um, are you gonna get risk managers from your organization into that play that are gonna wanna look at interdependencies of systems? Um, another example is the systemic studying that we do. So in finance, we have an organization called FSARC and it stands for Financial Systemic Analysis um, Risk Center. So a lot of that systemic planning that they're doing, um, they've worked with DHS, they work with other sectors. So that understanding through that work, through the concept of understanding what are your top risks, your vulnerabilities, and being able to prioritize that, that does take place and at different levels. So. Excellent, excellent. Right. Scott, would you, would you add to that? Um, I don't have all, yeah, I'm on mute. Okay, don't have a whole lot to add, um, but I, I would say that um, we're relatively new, uh, being only about eight months old. So our current focus is more on threat intelligence sharing, doing, you know, doing some webinars, um, but we are a member of the National Council of ISAC, so we do that bi-directional um, sharing. And from, a, from an experiential standpoint on my end, um, one of the things that I think is critical when you're looking at sharing vulnerabilities and threats is to um, make sure that the right information gets in the right folks hands at the right time. Um, we don't have time to, we're all busy and we don't have time to comb through, you know, eight pages of 11 font text to try to find something that is applicable to us. So um, I think understanding, you know, the, the equipment, um, understanding the threats that folks have is a, is kind of the big uh, elephant in the room, maybe that no one ever really takes a bite out of. So. That's a way to great, good way to put it. And I can tell you the space ISAC folks are going to be wanting to know who do I call in the in Scott's maritime ISAC if something that we share is uh, I need to speak to somebody who who do I dial? And so there's a discovery phase. I think we're going to we're going to see people go through. Three, Catherine, five, would you? Five, <laughs> um, oh, we, we check go ahead. all the time, but we're 24 seven. We have a watch desk. And so if anybody needs to get in touch with anybody in the communication sector, minus maybe the news satellite guys, um, you know, I'm on call 24 seven. I am the senior designated embedded rep to the Com ISAC and to DHS for continuity purposes. But if you need to get in touch with Charter, if you need to get in touch with Comcast, you call the NCC watch desk 703-235-5080 and you say, hey, this is Satellite Guys, ASOC, we need to talk to Charter, they can connect you. So there we go. There's, there's one simple answer. <laughs> That's a great answer. Simple is good. Um, well, let's talk about a bad day, a notional bad day for space. And, uh, you know, uh, we we lost something. We lost some of these capabilities, uh, PNT or communication or imagery or what have you. Um, it's a bad day. Um, how would we collaborate around those problems? How what would that look like uh, so we can kind of get back to where we should be? Um, Susan, would you start? 
So actually what I was thinking of is what happened with the recent uh, CyberStorm 2020 exercise just a month ago. And one of the plays, uh, one of the scenarios in JEX was GPS disruption, potential GPS disruption. And we saw that through uh, Ford Motor Company, right? So there was some impact with uh, the satellite communications. So what we're sitting here, we're, we're on our, our team site and we're going, okay, what is this? <laughs> How broad is this? Is it really telecom? Is it really connected to these other assets? So that idea of, you know, we did reach out, we put a request for information in. So that idea of thinking through, okay, when it's unfolding, now finance tends to be the consequences, right? We see the consequences of uh, things are starting to go bad. And then we, we rely on experts who built those systems, who understand the interdependencies, we pull them together and say, okay, what is this? You know, where does it point to that critical disruption asset? So that idea of, yeah, this is actually a really great opportunity, right, for Space ISAC, because we're able to take this consequence, potential sensor-like communication, but now how do we communicate with you? So that's a question. Um, you know, in, in some cases, you know, we, we threw um, through CISA, um, used to be NKIC, now it's CISA Central, right? So we have processes where our folks will connect, there's a formal RFI, but then we also have these more unofficial RFIs that go sector. And then from country standpoint, we're reaching across um, so to the country certs. Um, some of the countries have ISACs of their own that they've created. Um, so I, I, it's, it's not an answer, it's more of a question because we, we do something uh, now, but how do we do it better? That's excellent. Um, uh, so, Scott, who who are you going to call? What? How are we going to work this problem today? It's a bad day for space. What do we do? Yeah, I call Ghostbusters. Um, yeah. The folks there in this audience, we get that. I say that to my students, and they look at me like I'm crazy. Um, uh, so, I, again, I think this is. Uh, I'll hold that. That's my playbook. Like my playbook. Yep, I like it. So I, I just think this again goes back to the to the whole issue of, of planning. Um, you know, if if the the PNT stuff goes out uh, for maritime uh, services, there's going to be a huge issue. You're going to have ports that have ships stacking up. You could have accidents, um, a variety of different things. So, um, I would say that as soon as if if the space ISAC were to realize that there's a um, large outage, um, maybe more, maybe one or two providers, um, then reaching out and letting the, the maritime transportation system ISAC know that so that we could put that out to the to the folks involved would would be very crucial. Um, a lot of times, you know, we, we get information sort of piecemeal that, hey, GPS isn't working here. Is it a spoofing thing? Is it an outage? So, you know, I think that that just awareness. And then finally, I think the uh, in the continuity of business planning aspect, um, and I'm not sure how this would work, but, you know, have some sort of a backup plan. Um, I don't know if that's, uh, you know, ISAC level stuff or if that's individual customer level stuff. Um, but, you know, if satellite company A loses uh, a satellite and do you have a, a program where you can switch to satellite company B very quickly? Um, because the time to build that bridge is when there's not an issue. When you try to build that bridge in a crisis situation, it costs you, you know, blood, sweat, and tears. So that's a great answer, and I'll I'll, I'll ask Catherine in just a second, but maybe as to to frame that, um, what we talked about in the conversation we had prior to this uh, event was a potential role for the space ISAC to to be a, a bit of a subject matter expert on space systems. That is users of space could seek mm -hmm. advice from the space ISAC to advise them as to um, what, what's going on with this, this issue and, and so on. Um, but Catherine, you already have uh, many space uh, companies in your communication ISAC, so you already do that. Um, uh, talk, about, talk about how you, how you might address these bad day issues or how you do address these bad day issues. I, I would comment that you know the satellite industry is is in a huge pivot point and is exploding in terms of you know providers. So um, I, I'm not. I, I think there's I think there's going to be more than enough work for everybody to do. Let's put it that way. Um, when we're on a bad day, though, I mean, and, and let's talk about a super bad day because I'm I'm not I'm not going to focus on the fact that maybe um, my you know my broad my my television is is I'm not going to 
trivializes. It's going to be a super bad day. And all of a sudden, you know, some of the services and satellite guides do cover the globe. And they are the ones that are supporting uh, countless IoT kind of applications. So I don't think people really understand just how much they rely on space. But let's say that space has had a bad day and all of a sudden, I don't know, a quarter of the satellites are, are, are wonky. Well, a quarter of the satellites being wonky around this globe is going to be a huge impact on the availability and the fidelity and the confidentiality and the integrity of all the services that people use. Well, this is where, you know, this is not something that even the new satellite guys or the old satellite guys or the COM ISAC alone can figure out with government. This becomes, in essence, a triage program where we need to figure out, figure out what's impacted, what's the most critical that needs to be diverted, rerouted, resorted, whatever. And that is, that is in essence, a public-private discussion. So to my earlier point, you know, Space ISAC, welcome to the crowd. Thrilled to have you. Can't wait to learn more about all these really cool new satellite things that are happening. But I do think that finding a way to plug into that very bad day, you know, public, private, governmental kind of thing it is going to be one of the first things that, that you should be thinking about. And it's not because I'm anticipating a problem. It's not because I think there's going to be a problem, but because it's so easy to plan for a bad day when there is no bad day rather than to all of a sudden have to figure it out on the bad day. So it's a no cost thing to figure out and scope it out and to work together. Excellent. Well, um, so we're, we're gonna bring it home now. We've got a, just a few minutes left. So I'm gonna ask you to uh, make, your, make your answers short and, uh, and pithy and, and uh, impactful. And so I would ask you uh, simply what advice you would give the Space ISAC? How can that new entity serve the needs that your ISACs have and um, how, if you if you were to give them advice what is that advice let me let me start with Susan go go for it Susan so um, I think learn about us and we want to learn about you right so it, what um, Catherine said earlier the better we get we're going to get better and better at planning for that horrible day right and and the resiliency of that critical infrastructure, because some of it's pretty darn bad, right? I mean, what FSISAC does a lot of is, or not just FSISAC, our sector, uh, we try to find, are there manual operations workarounds for these things? And if not, how would we coordinate the, the safe closure of markets or stability of markets? So that's always going on. Um, the more, I think what Catherine said is, is can we have routines where we connect in with Space ISAC? where we're learning more about um, those assets that you're managing, right? Just today on, this, on, the, on the conference sessions, we learned so much just listening to the experts. So more and more of the summits, you know, having us join those and then vice versa, um, learning about those critical national functions and looking at your interdependent, how you affect these other um, critical assets and then exercising um, getting involved in, you know, more involvement, uh, sharing during the National Council of ISACs meetings and, and through that process. Excellent. That's great. Scott, what advice would you give? So short and pithy, I would say seek first to understand, then to be understood. That would be my uh, Stephen Covey advice. So, um, I wasn't yeah, happy. I, yeah, so. Um, wow. Oh, yeah. Nice. That goes on the coffee cup. There, there you good. go. Very yeah. good. But, uh, you know, I think I think Susan hit the nail on the head. You know, you have to um, learn about other other sectors and see where the dependencies fall. Um, I know I've been doing maritime stuff for about five years and uh, law enforcement for about 30. And I every time I talk to someone, I learn something new. So um, and I see another thing. Wow, that's a problem. You know, how are we going to solve that? So um, I think the space ISAC uh, would be well served to do that. Excellent. Thank you, Catherine. What advice? Um, I guess I have two, I have two words, or not two words, but two, two points. Um, one, you know, welcome to the ISAC land. Please don't waste your time doing all these onerous NDA kind of things. You're in the communication sector. We are hyper-connected. I rely on you. You rely on me. Between us, we're all kumbaya. If it's security related, if it's availability, confidentiality, integrity, and bit, just share, just share, just, just do it. But to do that, I do think, and I think Susan sort of used the bird of a feather kind of thing. I do think it's important for you to figure out, you know, what's going to be useful for you. I, they're going to, 
be various variations on a theme within your own ISAC. And candidly, you know, Lumen doesn't need to get any more, you know, threat alerts on Microsoft stuff. We got it. We got it. Okay. But what I care about is like my ATM frame relay guy really talking to the ATM frame relay guy because that's a really small community, but it's an important one. And I think that too, as you sort of decouple and sort of deconstruct your space ISAC, you'll find logical birds of feather where this is the type of information they want, but it's not useful to them. And for you to know that and to be able to hit that sweet spot for the space, you know, your space members in their birds of a feather, you'll be gold. That's excellent advice. And uh, so first, thanks to all three of our, our guests and their uh, excellent uh, thoughts. And guess what? You're going to be on our speed dial and we're going to reach out to you. So now we know how to find you and we know what to start talking about. So on behalf of our panel, I want to uh, thank our audience for uh, for their attention and uh, and look forward to seeing more progress in this uh, in this story. Thank you all and good day. Thank you, everybody. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks, everybody. Stay safe. Bye. -bye.